And our scripture lesson for today is Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, and this comes from the message. The Lord says, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I love that scripture because it, it gives me an expectant heart that God's about to do something brand new. My daddy, uh, for those of you who might be visiting today, uh, my daddy was an undertaker. And uh, so I was brought up, uh, me and my four brothers, uh, we were brought up uh, in the funeral business. And um, so I went to funerals just every week. I was going to funerals. And some stood out above others. Uh, you know, when you're in the funeral business, you, you have uh, some services that are high church, so to speak, the Catholic or the Episcopal or the Episcopalian, uh, United Methodist. Uh, you, and you, you have some services that are more, uh, um, golly, what's a nice way to say that? Uh, <laughs> They're just kind of different. You know, they, they, uh, they don't follow any kind of uh, routine. And, and uh, I've been in a lot of churches that, that just did things differently than, than that in which I was raised. But I was, as, as I said, I've seen all kinds of services. But I remember some services. For example, uh, maybe I'll share this with you, but one of the last services I had with my dad I was in a coal camp. Uh, near our home and uh, in southwestern Virginia and dad and I uh, this church was this little church was just on the side of a mountain and dad and I were standing in the back and, and dad would always stand in the back of a church during the funeral he'd, he'd kind of rock on his feet you know just kind of I, I never could do that real well but he'd rock back and forth he'd rock on his feet like that and so we're standing in the back of this church Right, right at the end of the back pew, kind of, and uh, Dad's rocking. And the preacher got up and he said, Brother John said, when I die, just push my casket aside and have church. And I'm standing there with my dad, and I thought, wonder what old Brother John meant by that. But the preacher wanted to find out, so he came around. He came around to the front of the pulpit, and he gave Brother John a shove. And, and he pushed the casket, and Brother John went rolling across the front of the church and hit the wall. <laughs> Never forget that. And, and the wall kind of went like this. It just kind of, it kind of moved, you know. And I thought, wow. And then, and then this woman jumped out right in front of us, jumped in the middle of the aisle. And she was a rather large person, and, and uh, Dad, Dad was about five, six, and, and, uh, I was a little taller than him, but, but this woman jumped out in the aisle and she threw her hands up like this and went, woo, like that. And, 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 and her eyes just kind of rolled in her head and she, she fell back and Dad was standing there rocking. <laughs> and this woman was coming toward him like a giant oak. And those arms were up in the air, and as she was going down, Dad reached out to catch her. And as he stuck his hand under her armpits there, like the limbs of a giant oak, they went like this. And when they locked down, she hit the floor, and Daddy did a one and a half over <laughs> on top of her. And his hands were locked into her armpits. And there I stood. <laughs> I stood and I said, um, Dad, you all right? And he looked up at me and he said, Get me off of this woman. <laughs> and and I, I thought, you know, I thought, interesting story to tell. But, but also, and, and, and really what I wanted to tell was, that was an unusual uh, service and... Uh, there was this woman that got up to sing. It wasn't the same one. Uh, we did remove her, but um, 
This woman got up to sing, and it was a great song. And uh, when, when I say this, I'm not making fun. I'm just enjoying, because I can enjoy the worship of other people and other traditions. And, and this woman sang, and then she had a guitar, and as she was singing, she just kind of took that thing off, you know, uh, like a rolling stone or something, just tossed the guitar to the side, and it's like someone was there with magic hands that caught it perfectly and, and kept playing without missing a beat, and she started running down the aisle. And I was a new Christian at this time, and I'm standing in the back, and this woman, you know, I've already seen one woman do a one and a half. I see my dad do a one and a half uh, over on this one lady in the aisle. But this, this woman started running down the aisle, and Dad and I were standing again, and Dad was a little nervous about rocking by this time. <laughs> and, and she's coming at me, and I thought, do I protect Dad, or what do I do? But the thing that hit me, I said, Lord, do I have to do that? And it's like he said, you don't have to do that, but you need to love me like that with that kind of a passion. And I thought, well, that'll preach. You know that? That that woman, when she did finally run by, she did strike us a couple of times. There wasn't room, and she bumped us or whatever. But it's like the Lord said, you need that kind of a passion. And maybe 2015 wasn't everything you'd planned it to be. Maybe you've made some mistakes. I know I sure did. And maybe there are things that you'd like to forget. But this is a new day. This is 2016. I love these new years because it's like a, a new beginning. And we serve a God who's big enough to, to give us new beginnings. And we need new beginnings. We need a new start. So where do we go? How do we get that? Now look at your outline. It's there in your bulletin. And you be sure and take that home with you and use that as kind of a, a, a reference this week as you think and rethink what I'm going to share with you. I'm just going to share five quick things and then we're going to come to the table and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. When we think about starting over, when we think about new beginnings, the first thing we need to do is we look back, we need to stop making excuses. Stop blaming other people for our mistakes. Uh, that gets us nowhere, a and, and really, um, we, we make these excuses, we point fingers, and it doesn't, it doesn't change anything. We look at our failures, and we say, I'm a victim of my circumstances, and all that kind of stuff, but let's stop making excuses. The scripture says in Proverbs 28, you see it there, a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful, but if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. People can hurt you, they can scar you, but they can't ruin you. They can't ruin you as a child of God because God offers new life to us. We're a different breed. We are a different breed. Look at the people around you. We're a different breed. We are. And, and, and there's a place where we can call a halt to this thing. And we need to be that kind of people. We need to be that kind of people. Now, now there are mistakes. Now, look at this. Common causes of failure. You see that? I list a few. One, we don't plan ahead. Right? Look at the scripture. A sensible man watches for problems and prepares to meet them. The fool never looks ahead and suffers the consequences. You've heard it. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail, right? You've heard that. You've heard that. Noah was building an ark before the rain ever came. He was planning ahead. When you set goals in your life, that's an act of faith. You understand that? That's an act of faith. That's a bold act of faith. So we need to plan ahead. A second thing I think that deals with excuses is we don't listen to others. Uh, there's a lot of people, say, they say a lot of good things around us. You've got friends that care about you. Maybe you need to listen to them. Look at the scripture, Proverbs 15. Plans fail without good advice. Why is that? In Proverbs 16, 18, I don't have that down there. You might want to jot that down. It says pride goes before destruction, Proverbs 16, 18, that we need to forget our pride and we need to begin to listen to people. Plan fail without good advice. We, never, we will never get anywhere, now listen to this, 
we will never get anywhere if we think we've already arrived. If we think we've already arrived, we're going to stop. God is saying, I've got a new journey for you in 2016. We'll not get there if we think we've arrived. You with me? Listen to people. Listen to those whom you trust. And, and I think a fourth part of that can be we'll give up too soon. Proverbs 24, if you give up when trouble comes, it shows that you are weak. Failure is the path of least persistence. Isn't that right? Failure is the path of least persistence because we quit. We quit. You shouldn't quit. You shouldn't quit. You, you, you believe that? Hello? Come out and play. Come out and play. George Washington lost two-thirds of the battles he fought in the American Revolution. Two-thirds. And yet, he's the father of our country. How about that? Or how about Babe Ruth? He hit 714 home runs. That's pretty good. But you may not know that he struck out 1,330 times. Isn't that right? Get excited about that. I watched TV the other day, uh, the other day at, a, at a game in Tampa Bay, and the stands were orange. And they were rooting for a team that lost a third of their games. Why is that? Because you believed they could win. Right? Think about that. Babe Ruth said this. He said, never let the fear of striking out keep you from taking a swing. You there? Don't give up too soon. The second thing, you, first of all, you stop making excuses. Secondly, you take stock. Evaluate the experiences you have in life. The scripture says in Galatians 3, Paul writes, you've experienced many things. Were all those experiences wasted? I hope not. One thing you have this year that you didn't have last year is more experience, right? Isn't that right? You have more experience this year than you had last year. You look at last year and you say, well, I failed in my finances. What do you have left? Work with that. Or, or I, I failed in my uh, relationships. Who's left? Deal with these people. Deal with these people. Make connections. Engage life. Go for it. Go for it. Take stock at where you've been. And then thirdly, moving right on, act in faith. We've already said when you set goals, you're acting in faith. You're acting in faith. Launch into new uh, territory. Begin to step out in faith at the level of risk. Two people came up to Jesus, and they were blind. And they're crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Look what happened. Look at the scripture, Matthew 9. According to your faith, will it be done to you? They went expecting. What are you expecting this year? More of the same? What are you expecting? What are you expecting from yourself? What are you expecting from God? A lot of times, we, we're careful with how we deal with God because we don't want him to look bad. We say that. <laughs> we're really worried about us looking bad. You know what I'm saying? Step out in faith. Act in faith. Look again at Scripture, Proverbs 16, 9. We should make plans, counting on God to direct us. You got that? Made any plans for the new year? You go through this year by design or by default. You understand that? You don't make plans for your lives, somebody else will. They will. So what's your design for the coming year? You go by, you live your lives by design or by default. That's what I'm talking about, counting on God. That's what the scripture says here, to direct us. Most of us spend more time planning a party than we do planning our lives. How many couples have I counseled with before a wedding, and they put more time in their wedding than they do their marriage? Sad to say, some of, for some of them, their wedding lasts about as long as their marriage. You with me? Where's the plan? 
What is the plan? Set some goals out there. You say, well, I'm not as young as I used to be. Who is? Somebody here as young as they used to be? <laughs> if you did, then, wow, goodness. You, you must have already hit the, uh, the wine or something, you know, that uh, are you as young as you used to be? None of us are. This, this is not a rinse on my hair, you know what I'm saying? But I'm looking at 2016. I'm expecting something. Are you? Act in faith. And then fourthly is to refocus. Proverbs 4. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thought. Whatever we focus on, we tend to reproduce in our lives. We focus on our failures, we find ourselves reproducing there. We need to begin to look at our lives and see what God has done and begin to focus. You say, we've got to renew our mind to do that. We don't think like that. And you say, how do you re renew your mind? Uh, Romans 12, 1 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and that's through the Word, through God's Word. You read the Word, and He begins to say things about you and bring things out of your life that you never, you never knew were there. To refocus, because again, what you focus on, you tend to reproduce. Let God's Word, let God's Word change your mind. Are you there? Be careful how you think your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now look at Psalm 1. This is one of my mother's favorite psalms. Happy are those who are always meditating on God's Word. They're like trees along a river that do not dry up. They succeed in everything they do. Jonah chapter 3 verse 1 it says, And the Word of God came to Jonah a second time. You might say, Well, I've tried this stuff. The Word of God came to Jonah a second time. He got a second opportunity. Goodness, I'm on my fifth or tenth or whatever, you know what I'm saying? But God comes to us this morning and says, I give you another opportunity. Refocus. Don't major in the failures. God is more interested in your future than he is your past. You remember we talked about that one day. He's more interested in your future than your past because your future is where you're going to spend your time in the days ahead. Is that not right? Sure it is. That future becomes your present day by day by day. But he didn't focus on the past. He's looking at the future. We need to look with him. We need to refocus our lives. And finally, we need to trust. We need to trust our strength is in Christ. It's not about trying. It's about trusting. It's not about trying. It's about trusting. Scripture. Look at the scripture. You will not succeed by your own strength or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. See, God is not just interested in church stuff. He's interested in every part of our lives. You know, we, we dress a certain way on Sunday morning. Uh, you may not believe this, but you can come by the office on Tuesday afternoon at 2.30, and I'll not be in a robe. Really. You can come by the house, you know, in the afternoon, and I'll not be in a robe. Really. I don't wear this thing all the time. I, shocked. You shocked up there? I knew it. I knew it. No, I don't do that. Because God's not just interested in old Joel on Sunday morning, nor you. He's interested in wherever we are, what we're doing. He wants to be in the middle of it. He wants to be in the middle of who we are and what we are doing. Why? Look at the scripture again. I love this. When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside He's not the same anymore. A new life, there it is again. A new life has begun. You might say, well, Joe, when I look at my life, it, it adds up to a bunch of minuses. It, it adds up to, to, to a, a liability with whomever I find myself. I'm a liability. I'm not an asset. I'm a minus. I'm not a plus. Ah, that's a lie. I don't believe that. You understand? You are. You know what, what changes that whole equation? Is a guy that was crucified between two thieves. Between two thieves. It changed everything for us. We are an asset. We are a positive. We're not a minus. If, you, if you're living a minus life, you're missing it. Because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life in John 10 and verse 10 and have it more abundantly. Are you there? Now, share one more thing with you, and we'll take communion together. In 1995, it was late 95 or 90, early 96, 
there was a principal. There was a principal uh, at high school in Alcoa, just retired, and he came by and he shared a story with me that, that just, it just impacted me. I've never gotten over it. It's a story about a guy named Kenny Snake Stabler. Does anybody know that? Snake Stabler. Uh, he died this year. You remember that? Great quarterback for the Alabama Cr uh, Crimson Tide. And, and, oh, what a quarterback he was. But he was a wild man. He was a wild man. Uh, it is said, I had a guy tell me this after the, the 940 service today. This guy told me, he came to me and he said, you know that, that Bear Bryant used to have him uh, locked up every Friday night before a game. Because he knew if he didn't, he'd, he'd end up locked up anyway. Because <laughs> he's a wild man. And, and Kenny Snake Stabler played, uh, had a great career at Alabama, then he went to the Oakland Raiders. And you remember? I mean, that championship team when he was there, every Monday night he won miraculously. I don't know how that worked. If you ever, if you ever saw any of those games, how did that work? He always, but he was a winner. Sports Illustrated. Sports Illustrated decided that they wanted to do uh, an article on the simplicity of the language of sports or the language of sport. And uh, so they wanted, to, they wanted to do this in a way that they wanted to prove the simplicity of this language that, that athletes use. So they thought, well, why don't we take Kenny Snake Stabler to the grave of one of our great writers and hand him a quote by that writer and ask him what that means. So they took, uh, they, they took the snake, they took him to the grave of Jack London, and they handed him this quote, and it's in your bulletin. And they said, "What? read that. And so he read it. He said, I'd rather be ashes than dust. I'd rather my flame go out in a burning spark than that it be steeled with dry rot. I'd rather be a splendid meteor blazing across the sky every atom in me in magnificent glow than to be a sleepy and permanent planet. Life is to be lived, not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I will use my time. Now, after he'd finished reading this quote by Jack London, they said, Snake, what's that mean? And he reached up and he scratched that old scraggly beard of his. And then the light came on. And he said, throw deep. This year, old Joe's going to throw deep. Ever since that old principal down in Alcoa showed me that, I've decided, I, I found out really quick that I was not looking. My eyes were, were down too much. They were not looking up to a God that has unlimited possibilities for me and for you. That God is on the sideline saying, throw deep, go for it with everything that you are. First Broad Street, throw deep. Let this be our greatest year as a church. We are the church, part of the church of Jesus Christ, not just here, all over the world. I'm throwing deep, and I want you to join me. Don't be satisfied with anything less, because we serve a mighty God who knows us and loves us and will empower us to be all that we were created to be. He's just looking for people crazy enough to throw deep with every part of their life. And I look across this room, and that's you, and that's me. We can throw deep. Amen.